Joao asks about the Charter. What is the European Charter of Fundamental Rights? The Charter of Fundamental Rights lists the basic rights to be respected by the Union and by the Member State when they implement Union law. It has been a legally binding instrument since the adoption of the Lisbon Treaty in 2009. The Charter set out rights in terms of dignity, freedoms, equality, solidarity, citizenship and justice. Many of the rights were very innovative, such as the prohibition of discrimination on grounds of disability, age and sexual orientation. The Charter must be dynamic and respond to the needs of an evolving society. Thanks for the question, Joao. It's, it's a, a super general question, but not easy. I mean, what, what is this Charter? Uh, it's a legitimate question. Uh, the easy reply is to say it is a human rights catalog, but that then for many people still would not mean much. A human rights catalog is obviously a catalog, a list of human rights entitlements that we have. Some of such rights would be just for citizens, like the right to vote uh, and other rights you would have whenever you are a human being. So you're born as a human being and you immediately have these entitlements. And you find these catalogs also at national level in your home country, uh, close to all EU member states have in their constitutions a part, which is normally part two, sometimes part one of the national constitution that lists these uh, uh, rights. And these human rights catalogs normally have a constitutional standing. And what does that mean? That means that whenever there is a piece of law or an administrative decision at national level, it has to be in line with the uh, constitution. So the constitution is sort of a piece of super law that overrules whatever comes below. And, and that makes human rights um, special. So, you know, the right to private life or the freedom of expression, these are human rights and they can only be limited under certain conditions. And that's all um, defined in these human rights catalogs. So that's what a human rights catalog is. And now the EU, since 2000, has its own human rights catalog. So it's, it's a bit mimicking a state. It, it also has now a human rights catalog. And this catalog, the charter, is legally binding since 2000. First, uh, 2009, 1st of December 2009. And that's a strong symbol, but it is also legally speaking an important thing to have because the Court of Justice, that's the EU court, would strike down any piece of EU law that is not in conformity with human rights. So you might remember that the, um, the legislator wanted to introduce an obligation that every telephone call is sort of uh, retained in its length uh, and, it, and, 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 and its um, location by uh, the telecommunication, telecommunication companies. That was laid down in a data retention directive and the Court of Justice in April 2000, I think uh, 14, stroke down that directive saying, no, we cannot have such a piece of legislation. It is in violation of the human uh, uh, right to uh, privacy and data protection. So, so that is in a way what the Charter of Fundamental Rights is in, in not so short words, maybe. Peter wants to know what distinguishes the Charter from other human rights conventions and from the constitution of individual member states. Well, each member state adopts its own constitution. It sets the rules that will govern the state. The human rights conventions are a series of international treaties and other instruments that have been adopted since 1945 to extend the protection of human rights. The Charter is something else. It is an instrument of the Union, which has emanated from our institutions. It is part of the Union's primary law and is therefore on the same level as the treaties. The European Union must always respect the Charter and so must the Member State when they implement Union law. Uh, Peter, this is a, a very good question because just yesterday I had here uh, at the FRA in, in Vienna a, a group of uh, 45 national judges and they were putting exactly the same question. So even legal practitioner 
are a bit confused about this multiplicity of human rights instruments that you have now. And they wonder, well, why would we need an additional instrument? We already have national human rights catalogs. We have the Council of Europe instrument that uh, Carolina was mentioning, the ECHR, and now again, another one, the, the European Union. Is that really needed? So what is the added value? And I give you three, um, hopefully, uh, succinct replies. The first one is that the charter contains also those rights that are EU specific. So the EU legal system gives you certain rights that you would not have under the other legal systems. And, and uh, most of them you would know by heart. So for instance, the right to vote and to stand as a candidate for the European Parliament elections, or also the, the right to participate in the local election. That is a right that, that you have as EU citizen and it is guaranteed by the charter, but by definition, not by the ECHR, by the Council of Europe. Uh, instruments. Then you have, for instance, the right to diplomatic protection. If you tomorrow you travel to Morocco, uh, you get robbed, um, you realize that your home country doesn't even have an embassy. So then you have the right as a new citizen to address the, for instance, uh, German embassy to take sort of a, an, an example of a powerful EU member state. And, and Germany is obliged to protect you as a EU citizen. So that is an EU entitlement that only in the charter would be listed and not in other human rights catalogs. So that's number one. Secondly, if you compare the charter with the Council of Europe instrument, the ECHR, you would see that uh, there are uh, a total new group introduced of rights, namely social and economic rights that you would not find in the ECHR. So the right to protection against unfair dismissal, um, uh, the right to health, uh, all these rights you only find in the charter, but uh, not in the ECHR. And also when it comes to equality and the protection against discrimination, the charter is very specific in dealing with specific groups of persons. So for instance, the charter even has rights uh, of the elderly, or the charter refers to the persons with disabilities, and it has a very detailed list of children rights. So that is something you would not have in the ECHR. And finally, my last point, comparing the charter with the national catalogs, you would also see that the charter is very modern. For instance, the right to marry in the charter is gender neutral. It's not about man and woman like in the ECHR, it's gender neutral. But also it, it is, is modern because it also includes a right to good environment, Article 37, or uh, the right to consumer protection, Article 38. These are rights you would normally not find in, in uh, uh, constitutional uh, human rights catalogs. Uh, simplifying, one could say that for every provision of the charter, you would find on average 10 member states whose constitutions would not reflect that entitlement in written constitutional law. And that already shows you that the, the charter um, is a very efficient instrument to promote uh, human rights because it helps you um, getting understanding of what, what human rights are. Princier says that the charter is perhaps imperfect, but insists on its usefulness for citizens. That is right. The charter is imperfect, but it offers strong protection that makes European citizens equal. The Charter shows the maturity of a society that wants to make clear what human dignity is all about. However, there is a limitation. The articles of the Charter are addressed only to the institutions and bodies of the Union and to the Member State, but only when they are implementing Union law. Yeah. So maybe let's start with the negative in order then to turn to the positive. I always say that the charter is easy to read, but difficult to understand because it does not always apply. That the big advantage of the ECHR and of national human rights is that they always apply. The charter only applies vis-a-vis -vis states when they deal with an issue that is regulated by European Union law. So if you are dealing with something that has no link with European Union law, you cannot invoke the charter. That's the very important limitation that we have in mind. But once we know that the charter applies, then it is very useful 
because it is supranational, as the lawyers say. So that means it can have direct effect in the national legal system. Uh, that's very different with the ECHR or international human rights. They would not have automatic uh, direct effect. So just to give you some, some examples, um, if you have, for instance, a case in, in front of your national court, a municipal court, a regional court, be it about you know, uh, family law issues or whatever, and you know that EU law is relevant, then you can ask your national court to request a preliminary ruling of the EU court in Luxembourg. And that procedure is far quicker than addressing the Strasbourg Court for Human Rights in, in, uh, of the Council of Europe, because there you would have to run through the whole legal system. That's very different. If you use the charter under EU law, you can sort of directly uh, end up in Luxembourg if you convince your national court to do so. Secondly, let's take an example that you're dealing with your national administration. <clears throat> you get a decision by a ministry or a, a municipality that you don't like, and you realize that they are applying a piece of national law that is actually in contradiction with the charter. Well, then you can make the point that actually the civil servant who applies the law against you has to disapply the national provision that is not in line with the charter. So you have this direct effect, which is uh, interesting. If then, for instance, you are an NGO and you um, are working in a specific field, the beat, uh, I don't know, you work for the rights of asylum seekers or you're uh, promoting children rights, and you see that the, your national government is um, planning to issue a piece of legislation that in your eyes uh, is problematic from a human rights law perspective, but that specific entitlement is not enshrined in your national constitution, which for child rights is often the case because the charter is far more specific than national law. But then you, you would use the charter, you would tell the politicians working on the draft that uh, the draft actually falls in the scope of union law and is in violation with the charter and therefore it should be uh, amended. So I think that that points us, uh, points us um, already shows that, uh, that you can use the charter in your, in your uh, national activities, be it professional activities, but also in, in your private uh, life. I fully agree with the charter. It's a dynamic and living instrument. It has to protect an evolving society and it cannot leave room for impunity. If there are member states in which the charter is not respected and its principles are violated, we cannot look the other way. My proposal is that citizens should have greater protection against infringement of the rights protected by the charter. We need to take a step forward and expand the material scope of application, not only when member states implement union law, but also when they implement their internal law. The Charter should be a universal instrument that prevents possible attacks on the democratic principles and values established in the treaties at national level. Well, thank you, Christina, for that, for that question. That's, of course, a very difficult question. It's also a slightly political question. Um, and I think it's undeniable that there is a sense of frustration of people that um, the EU obviously is not capable of addressing the phenomenon of, of rule of law backsliding, as, as it's often referred to in, in certain member states. Um, at the same time, we have to say two things. Where one is that rule of law and human rights are not the same; they do overlap, but uh, they are still about different things, right? The rule of law is also about very basic structures of a state, um, the exact design of the judiciary. Uh, for instance, how would you elect constitutional judges? Um, what role would uh, the, the judiciary have? How would you structure the judiciary? How would the different public authorities relate to each other, um, the president to the uh, prime minister, etc. And much of this is actually not ruled by European Union law. And given that the EU is not a state and is currently also not meant to become a state, the, the means and tools available for the European Union to 
sort of rule into a member state in order to get it back on track if there are issues with the rule of law are limited. But the trend has been uh, remarkable. So I think the European Union that we see now is completely different from the European Union that we saw in 2012, when sort of the first um, backsliding, rule of law backsliding um, phenomena materialized. Um, we have now things available which we wouldn't even uh, have thought of uh, five or 10 years ago. I'll just give you um, three examples. We have uh, now every year, that the European Commission issues a report on every EU member states, analyzing in detail the rule of law situation. And since this year, actually even concluding with recommendations that the member states should implement. And that of course creates a very different awareness of the rule of law. Uh, secondly, we have since rather recently, a so-called rule of law conditionality regulation that allows the European Union to withhold EU funds if it has the impression that a member state is um, not sticking uh, to the rule of law principles. Now, the final decision, of course, is a political one. Um, and you will always have people who say, no, the EU should not have a say at all in this issue. And on the other spectrum, you will have people who say, well, the EU is far too diplomatic. They should have intervened harsher, earlier, uh, better. But it, it, the system nevertheless changed. We have also now in the Council of the European Union, so that's where the ministers sit, uh, a, an annual dialogue on the performance of countries in the rule of law, an area that 10 years ago was perceived as being totally outside the reach of the EU institutions. And we even see now that the EU legislator is sort of um, intervening in the area of the media. The, the, the Media Act will see an, an, a new EU engagement in that field. So to conclude, I think it's a bit, it's an interesting situation because there's a discrepancy. We see on the one hand uh, that the EU was never as active in the field, both uh, human rights as, a, as rule of law. And at the same time, the situation is rather sobering on the ground. And then, of course, this allows for two conclusions. Either one would say, well, obviously, the EU is underperforming because they invest so much, but there's a meager turnout. Or we would conclude in saying, well, the times that we are living in are very, very difficult for human rights and the rule of law. And I prefer, as you might understand, the, the second reading, because I see that the EU, on a day-to-day -day basis, is pushing hard to um, perform better and increase the rights of uh, citizens uh, as we are all.